G'day Nigel here from Sax School. Well, hey, welcome to Sax School Live number nine. In this session, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to be talking to you about how to create your perfect saxophone practice space. Really, really important. I'm also going to share some tips. Share some tips. I'm going to share some tips on reeds and how to fix a dodgy saxophone sound too, which is uh, something that all of us struggle with at some point. Um, but mostly, we're going to have some fun just hanging out for the next half an hour or so and talking about saxophone and hopefully answering some questions of yours too. So, if you're joining us live, then please jump in the chat, say hi, and uh, let us know what you're doing with your saxophone, what you've been up to this week, and any questions, stick them in the chat as well, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. And if you're watching a replay on Facebook or on YouTube, then same thing, get those comments in there. We do check them all, uh, but you can also reach out to us on our Facebook page, Sax School at Facebook, or on YouTube and the YouTube comments, or just old-fashioned, send us an email, saxschool at mcgillmusic.com. So, if we've not met before, my name's Nigel. I run this thing called Sax School, which is a really cool place to learn saxophone online. It's a video learning platform. And in fact, thousands and thousands of people use Sax School from all over the world. And the cool thing about saxophone, about Sax School, is that you can really choose your own path. We've got over 600 lessons in there, and they're all divided into courses and categories, ranging in different uh, from beginner right up to advanced stuff. So you can find something that really suits you and then get stuck in learning in our very easy to follow simple video system with downloadable worksheets and backing tracks and all that sort of good stuff. And the other really cool thing about Sax School, which is a big part of what we do, is we've got a super interactive community of learners online. So as a Sax School member, you get access to our online community and that's a just amazing place because we've got people connecting with each other getting support, sharing ideas, even meeting and um, playing music together and recording together and creating bands and all sorts of crazy stuff. So that's a big part of Sax School as well. Okay, well, that's um, that's what Sax School's about. I guess I we've got a ton of stuff. We've got a big long list of stuff to go through with you today. Um, but before we get stuck in with that, I thought we should do the quiz. The quiz! Because we do a quiz each week and it's kind of fun. And I think this time you might get this one. Let's have a look. So this week, I want to know if you know who the sax player was that toured with the Stones, the Rolling Stones, for about 40 years. So this guy's a bit of a legend, no longer with us, unfortunately. But if you know the name of the Rolling Stones sax player, the legendary guy that did it for like 40 years, then jump in the chat and let us know. And uh, we'll be coming back to that answer at the end of this session. So, got the whole team with me today. Chris is here, Claire's here. How are you doing, guys? Hi, I'm good, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks for Good, good, good. Um, I'll have a chat with you guys in a second, find out what you've been up to. Um, but I think, first of all, I should just, since it's my show, I'm going to tell you what I've been up to this week. Uh, and uh, as always, I've been busy creating new lessons for Sax School. Um, I mentioned in the show last week that I was away over the summer, so uh, I've been really busy the last three weeks now, doing lots of practice on things like tone and... Um, uh, intonation and just strength building stuff. Like everybody else, I need to practice to keep my chops in shape, so I've been busy at that. And I've also been busy creating a new, well, a couple of new courses, but one of them is a five minute workout. We've got a series of five minute workout lessons starting to show up in the Sax School members area, and I was building one this week, which is all about major scales, which is a whole lot of fun. So that's what I've been busy doing. What about you guys? Um, what about you, uh, Claire? What's been going on in the Facebook group? Oh, it's, been, it's been a great week in the Facebook group, as usual, uh, busy, busy. Um, I think this week we might, ready to be correct on this, I think we might have found our youngest ever member of Sax School. Really? Yeah, we had a, a video, in fact, I think we had two videos posted from Joel, aged 11. 11, yeah, fantastic! Yeah. His mum posted the videos, obviously because he's not on Facebook yet. Uh, she, he's been a Sax School member for a while, I think, but he's only just plucked up the courage to post up a video. Um, his mum signed him up to sax school after he'd been learning for a couple of years at school. It was really, really, really committed, doing really well. So she signed him up. He's really enjoying sax school. So it was great to see his videos and loads of members jumped in and gave him really great feedback and comments. That was really lovely. So yeah, he's that's that our youngest cool. member. I think that's, that's got to be our long, youngest member, 11. Amazing. I think there's a big gap between our youngest <laughs> member and our next youngest member. 
Jesus. Probably something in the order of about 30 years of him. So that's pretty great. Wow, good on him. Good on Joel. That's fantastic. I'll have to look out for more videos from him. That's fantastic. Yeah, that was brilliant. What uh, else has been going on there? Well, we had a, had a good question actually from Ivan, who uh, had been working on a sax school lesson, one of the beginner lessons on Swing Low Sweet Chariot. And she was wondering about whether she should be tonguing some of the longer notes. She felt it sounded a bit strange, wasn't quite sure. So, That's a good um, question. I think particularly for beginner players and uh, that beginner course, getting started with saxophone, is it's great if you're brand new to saxophone. I know thousands of people have used that course and it's a great sort of introduction. But one of the things that isn't clear, I suppose, when you're starting out, it's, it's quite confusing, is the whole thing about tonguing. And when I do, we do monthly masterclass sessions with our sax school students and it's something that we talk about quite a lot. So I think it's really important actually, Yvonne, if you're watching, or for anybody else who's relatively new to saxophone, who's uh, watching today, that tonguing is something that you should be doing all the time when you're, when you're playing. Definitely at the start. So the aim should be to start every single note that you play with your tongue using that ta or t syllable where your tongue's just coming up and touching the end of the reed and starting the note very clearly. And getting into the habit of doing that will help you down the track because uh, tonguing is an integral part of playing saxophone. And although we may swap between slurring and tonguing notes down the track, getting that skill right at the start is really, really important. So yeah, super good, super important uh, question. Cool. So loads going on over in the Facebook group then. Loads going on, yeah. And as usual, everybody's been really supportive and uh, chipping in and giving each other advice. Uh, you know, people have been learning a bit longer, uh, helping out the beginners, so that's great. I do love that, you know, in the Facebook group, how people are so supportive, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, that story about Joel is a good example, but it happens all day, every day, where po people are popping videos in there and saying, this is what I've been doing, or, you know, I've only just started, but I... Uh, brave enough to try making this little recording and it, you, know, you get a bunch of people who respond and I think that's wonderful because if you're stuck uh, at home learning by yourself it can be a bit of a lonely experience I think without a network of people around you and you know that's one of the things I love about sax schools it gives you that gives you that uh, support network I suppose so Chris what about you what's going on now it, on your side of sax school we've had a good week we've had a few new members this week we had uh, Matthew Lazola uh, who has just recently joined, he joined on the 7th, and uh, he's left a, a very nice comment on uh, the Reading Music 1 course, which is all about teaching you how to read music and the foundations. He said, this lesson was great for someone like me, just learning to read music, extremely helpful and informative. Thanks for starting out slow for someone who has no previous experience reading music. Oh, that's good to hear. I think that's probably one of the, the fundamental parts of SAC School is that it's accessible for, for all the people who are yeah, you know, beginners and intermediates. It's a good point, Chris. Uh, it's hard for us to remember. I mean, you're a really good saxophone player, and we, I've taught you for years, and we know, I know what you're able to do musically. And it's, I think when you've been playing for a long time, you forget that initial process of learning to read music, and it's quite a daunting, you know, obstacle at the start. Mm, there's lots to pick up on and learn, yeah. There is, yeah. I was saying, I mean, I'm sure, Claire, you, you read music too, so you probably have experienced the same thing. So mm -hmm. it, it's difficult, I think, for people who have never played before, um, and never read any music before to go into that. It's uh, it's a huge obstacle, and um, so yeah. I mean, hopefully, well, it's great to hear that story, and uh, hopefully, those lessons in sax school sort of ease that process. I think a lot of it's about confidence, and once you get that confidence up, then you're on your way. Definitely. Cool. Well, what else has been going on? We've had uh, yeah, we've had a, a couple of comments. We've had some questions, but I think we might be getting to some of those later. So all right, if you have any questions in the chat, feel free to uh, let us know, and we'll we'll try and relay them to Nigel if we have time at the end. Yeah, and I promise I wouldn't tell you tell everybody about Wednesday, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, we had a little moment. <laughs> Shall I? No, I'm not. I'm not going to. Uh, I'll, I might just keep that one in my back pocket because it yeah, might just come in. <laughs> okay, right, yeah. So. So I've uh, also been busy this week. I created this <laughs> checklist for you. Now, this is exciting. So, at least I'm excited about it. Is that right or wrong? I don't know. But this is something that I want to talk to you about today. And you can get your hands on this checklist and we'll share a link a bit later on in the session today. Now, what this checklist is about is something, a topic that I think is really, really important. I think that most people, everyone's excited about starting to learn saxophone. You know, you make the decision, I'm going to learn saxophone. And you spend loads of time looking at the choosing which saxophone you're going to buy and probably which mouthpiece and imagining how, how all those adoring fans are going to just be raving about you when you're playing that killer solo. You've got all that stuff planned out. But what most people overlook is the 
process of learning how to practice. And along with that is setting up the practice space. It's a big part of the whole thing. And you need to get a proper um, system about the way that you practice, everything about the way that you practice, so that you can really set yourself up to get to that goal that you've been thinking about. I wrote a book called The Ultimate Guide to Practicing Saxophone. It's just a simple little book, but it really drills down on all the things about that. And um, I know thousands of people use that all the time. It's great. But one aspect of that that I want to talk to you about today is about setting up your practice room. And that's what this practice room checklist is about. So some simple ideas in, in here, but I think often the simplest ideas are the ones that are the most powerful that we most often overlook. So this checklist is just something to go through and make sure that you've got that side of things properly buttoned up. Okie dokie, so you ready to go through this? And if you've got any thoughts actually as we're going through this, make sure you pop it in the comments. Maybe it's something you've already experimented with, some of these points or the things that you've got something you'd like to add about it as well. But this is just um, a sort of basic overview. There's three parts, I think, to getting your practice area set up. And I should preface this by saying that you know, I'm very fortunate I've got a music studio where I live and, and I, I can practice in here all the time, and all my gear's in here. But there's been plenty of times over the years where I've spent hours practicing underneath the staircase or in a little backstage room or in the rainforest or in my back garden, wherever I could find a space. So these principles apply to wherever you happen to be practicing. It's more about approaching it the right way. First thing off is making sure that the space that you're practicing is away from distractions. Sounds really obvious, but I think you know, there's lots of us have been guilty at some point of trying to practice in the corner of the room while the kids are running around and the dog's running past you and uh, you know, you're getting knocked over as the kids are reaching for the fridge and all that sort of stuff. So it's great if you can find a space, a space that has no distractions. So free from distractions and even better if it's free from other people so you can properly focus in on what you're doing. Now, free from distractions also means no TV. Don't have your TV on. You don't need to be watching you know, Antiques Roadshow while you're, um, while you're practicing your saxophone or have your Facebook feed on or your Instagram or your Twitter or whatever else, your social media that you, that you like to have on. So get free from everything so you can just focus on your music. Now, I always think it's important to have lots of light where you're practicing. Maybe it's just because my eyesight's getting worse. But uh, make sure you've got plenty of light. Make sure that it's... Um, there's enough space for you to be able to practice in. And also, just a little top tip, it's a great idea if you can find a space that's got carpets or curtains or soft furnishings, because that will always sound better. It'll be kinder on your ears. And uh, I've practiced in my kitchen a few times. I've made some videos for YouTube in my kitchen, but my kitchen is really bright and shiny and the sound's really bright and shiny. And if I practiced in there a lot, I'd probably go deaf. So equally, practicing in a bathroom is not great for you. So find somewhere like a lounge room or a bedroom is great. Um, so that's something that really helps. Any comments? Yeah, it's a great comment actually from Leonardo. I think you're probably picking up on it now actually. He mentioned about, uh, he says, have you got any tips for acoustics in the practice area? And I guess the whole thing about soft furnishings is a big one there, but have you got anything else about acoustics? Yeah, I mean, that's the main thing. I mean, you know, there's, acoustics is one of those subjects. Uh, was it Leonardo? Yeah. So acoustics, Leonardo, is a subject area that is a massive subject area. And if you're really full on into it, then there's lots of mathematical things you can do about the room to make sure that it's going to be acoustically right for you. But in the simplest terms, I think aiming for something that's got soft furnishings, aiming for a place that doesn't have parallel, hard, blank walls, that's what it's about. Because the reason that your bathroom or your kitchen doesn't sound as good as your lounge room is because the sound comes out your saxophone and then it bounces and it bounces and goes backwards and forwards like this and we end up with all these reflections and it's really bright on your ears. Whereas if you're playing in your bedroom, for example, where there's, there's a, a bed and a duvet and maybe a carpet and maybe some curtains, um, then all of those things absorb the sound and some the ceiling is flat and the sound will probably bounce off there and maybe some of the walls, but it's broke, the sound is broken up as it bounces around the room and it sounds much nicer. And this is the reason why if you look inside, if you ever had a chance to go inside a recording studio, the rooms are never just flat, rectangular, square um, walls and ceiling and hard floor without anything on them because it sounds awful. So they always have lots of different shapes and things to break the sound up and that's really the key. So 
You can use those principles though in some unlikely spaces, you know, practicing underneath the stairs might sound weird, but if it's the right shape and it's got, hasn't got parallel walls and it's got some soft stuff in there, then it might, might sound really good. So that would be my top tip on that, Leonardo. Okay, so you've chosen your space. <laughs> oh dear. So, you've chosen your space. So the next thing is having your right gear. Again, sounds really obvious, but this is a little checklist that you should go through and make sure that you've got this stuff right. This is all about easing the process so that you can make sure that you're really set up, ready to make the most of that precious practice time. So obviously you're gonna need a music stand, you're gonna need your saxophone, you're gonna need your reeds and your cleaning gear, but you're also gonna make sure, you need to make sure that you've got your computer or your laptop or your iPad or whatever you watch your sax school lessons on, charged up there, ready to use. Or if you're an old school learner, you need to have your music books there. So uh, you need to have whatever it is that you're watching your, or learning from or working from. So that's going to be available for you. And two other things that I think, well, three other things. The uh, first two things are a tuner and a metronome. I think always you should have those sat on your music stand, ready, ready to be used. I'm using one at the moment called, I mentioned it last week, Total Energy Tuner. I'm not affiliated with them, but I just think they're great. It's um, Android and iOS, and it's a really cool app because I've got it on my iPad when I'm practicing, because in the one app you can have a metronome and a tuner. So I like efficiency, and that does two things in one, so that's fantastic. But have those tools ready for you to go. And the third thing is, and this is just an add-on, but I think it's a really good thing to consider, is have some sort of recording device. Now that could be an app on your phone, okay? But that's probably what I'd suggest a dictation app or a, a little basic practice recorder. I have an app actually that, I, that I've, well, I haven't made, but it's a, my own app called Sax Tracks, which is another good idea because it's got simply one big button, you press the button and it records you and you can record with backing tracks and stuff. The point is keep it really simple, have it with you, because recording yourself as you're learning something and then referencing it by look, listening back is one of the most powerful ways to check your progress and to pick up things you otherwise would miss. So that's the gear. Do I miss anything else, Chris? Can you think of any other gear that you should have? Ooh, I'm trying to think what else could be. Um, cover tuners, cover metronomes. Yeah, I um, thought you were going to say a cup of coffee there. Yeah, well, that does help. <laughs> well, you've got to keep your instrument clean. Keep Nigel. your instrument clean, that's mm. right. You don't want a cup of coffee. <laughs> Bottle of water. Mm. Bottle of water, that's what you need. Okay, if you've got anything else that you think is your essential piece of kit, stick that in the comments because I'd love to hear. I'm sure there's some uh, crazy things that I haven't thought of yet. Okay, oh, and a pencil. Every good musician has a pencil there ready to go as well. Okay, so you've got your space chosen out. You've got all of your gear. And uh, the third piece of the puzzle really is um, the things that you need to make sure that you've got in place so that you can get keep that momentum going and really make the most of this practicing, not just in the first session, but in every session. So I've got a couple of last point pointers for you. First of all, and this is a really, really important point that nearly all of us are guilty of neglecting, and that is to set a schedule for when you're going to practice and make sure you stick to it. So make, make a decision of when you're going to be practicing this week, next week, this month, and even better, tell your spouse or your roommates or your kids or whoever's in the house with you that uh, that's what you're going to be doing and ask them to keep you honest about it. I'm going to be practicing on Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday at 9am and if I don't, tell me off. You know, make yourself accountable. Don't let anything get in your way. Okay, and then our practice diary is a really good one too. So this could be some notes on your phone, it could be a little notepad, whatever works for you, but just sketching down a couple of point is about what you did that day. And the final thing is, make sure you're planning out the four elements for every practice session. So you're doing a warm up, you're doing some technique work, you're doing some new material and you're playing something fun. So there's loads more in, in this whole thing about planning out your practicing. This, you can download this guide, we'll give you a link to it uh, at the end of the session. But if you want some more stuff about this, I definitely suggest checking out The Ultimate Guide to Practicing Saxophone. You can get it from our website. It's one of those things, you, you spend a lot of money on your saxophone. Uh, a book like this costs a small amount of money, but honestly, I've seen it happen thousands of times where that's made the difference between somebody continuing the saxophone or giving up. So, 
Any other pointers on that? Please pop it in the comments because I'd love to hear your thoughts on that too. Anything else, Claire? Yeah, I think we're covered actually. Uh, jo mentioned that she uh, has a pencil and rubber, as you mentioned, but she also uses a highlighter. Yes. To highlight wow. and things like repeats or coders, little bits that she might need to keep a, an eye on when she's doing a practicing. Um, That's a really good point, Joe. actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, Particularly for repeats, it makes it much easier for repeats. But don't do it if you're using the, the music from the band that you practice with. <laughs> <laughs> Um, John Carlo also mentioned actually um, that sometimes if you if you're in a very cluttered space, it can be distracting and it's kind of difficult for you to focus because you're constantly looking at the basket uh, basket of ironing in my case. So um, <laughs> trying yeah. to kind of have a, a calming space where you're not distracted by those that clutter probably a good idea as well. Yeah, definitely, John Carlo. That's a good uh, that's a good point. And uh, I think it's all about understanding the way that you think and the way uh, that you you work, what, what's a space that works best for you? I always think too, one last point on this, I, I mean I could talk about this sort of stuff all day, I think it's really, really important, but um, I think ultimately it's great if you can find a place that is your place. If that's the corner of the lounge room, but that's where you always do it, and you, you're familiar with it, and you're comfortable there, and you can get your stuff set up quickly, even have all pack all of your stuff away in one bag so you can have it all together so you can quickly go there set your stuff up quickly and then get started all those things they sound like small things but they make a big difference to the way that you progress and i think at the start whether you're coming back to saxophone after a break or whether you're starting from scratch it's about getting that that momentum going that really makes the difference so getting into the habit of practicing in a way that works for you, that you can continue to do, that's manageable, because then you're going to be able to really see results. Okay, cool. So anyway, that's the checklist, practicing checklist, and we'll put a link to that where you can download it from our website in just a little bit. Okie dokie, wow. So, um, so guys, we've got some other questions here. We've got any other, before we get started with these, got any other questions that have come in? We've had uh, a question from Cor Janssen, I think it's pronounced, uh, and uh, they ask, how can I produce a better tone using low C and B? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parts to that question, actually. Um, so, what, was it Janssen? Uh, Cor, I think, is Cor, the first name. Cor. G'day, thanks for the question. Um, radio. so low C and low B, it could be a couple of different things. The most common thing is or well, that could be causing a problem with that, is an actual a technical issue with a saxophone where it might not be sealing properly. It's really common down the bottom end of the saxophone for there to be leaks, and it, because basically the saxophone can go out of adjustment. Now, it's nothing to panic about because it's something that's fixed really easily. It's just because of the way they're made, a blow to the bell can cause problems down there. So if you're trying to get those low C and B out and it's sounding like wah, 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 like that kind of thing, then that could be the problem. If that's not the problem, then the, it's important to check that your fingers, if you're relatively new to saxophone, it could be, this is such a common thing, this finger here, our left hand ring finger, it's one of our least coordinated fingers in our hands, and it's really easy for that one to come off when we're concentrating on these ones down here. So make sure you've got all of your fingers down, and if you've got that right, then I would definitely just try relaxing your embouchure a little bit more, using a bit more mouthpiece, and uh, maybe even experimenting with a slightly softer reed. That might, that might help you as well. So there's three tips for you. If you want to find out more about those leaking issues, you can check out on my YouTube channel. Maybe, Chris, you can find a, a link for that. Um, I have done a little series of videos about identifying common mechanical issues with your saxophone, and it's just a good starting point, really. Okay, cool. So, uh, right, well, we've got some other questions that I want to get through, and Claire's looking at me expectantly. Have you got a question, Claire? No, no, no. no you're, the bathroom you're right, is just over there. Just <laughs> no. oh, so she's got a hand funny. up. Hey, Sam, Peter. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, uh, if you've got a question, I've got a couple of questions that have already come in I want to answer, but if you've got a question that you need some help with, bung it in the comments and we'll try and get to it. Okay, so just a couple of quick ones. So, um, we had a question from Neil, and Neil was saying, how do I know what is the correct reed size for me? A good question, and if you've been playing for a while, I guess it seems obvious, but when you start out, it's not obvious at all. I, I think it's good to be systematic with your reeds, Neil, and this for anybody else as well. So if you're brand new, 
then reeds go up in half sizes. So I would start with a one and a half or a size two reed. And when you're starting out, you need to develop your muscles in your embouchure around your mouth. And if you can play comfortably for you know, 10 minutes without your mouth becoming really, really sore and tired, then your reed is probably a comfortable size for you. But if, you've, if you're really struggling to get a sound out, let's say you jump straight up to a two and a half or a three, what's gonna happen is it's gonna be really hard to get a sound out. You're gonna to have to work so hard with your embouchure, it's gonna be really uncomfortable and you're not gonna be able to control the sound. So that's an indication that the reed is too hard. But on the other end of the scale, if the reed is too soft, then you, you hardly need to use any effort to get the sound out, and the sound is going to sound very uncontrolled and raucous. So you need to find the sweet spot between airy and really hard to play, and raucous and too easy to play. Somewhere in the middle is your perfect reed size. So Neil, I hope that helps you. The best thing to do is to experiment with different reed sizes, and don't forget different reed brands can behave in different ways. So to be really systematic, I would try a couple of different brands on a couple of different sizes. And Eventually you will find what works for you, and then you sort it. So that's reeds. If you've had a problem actually with this, or if you've got anything you'd like to add, make sure you stick something in the comments about that too, because I'd like to hear what, what you think about that. Okay, another great question here. Um, so Lewis, now this is a good question actually. Lewis Hansen was saying, I bought a Rico B5 ma uh, mouthpiece, and I found that my B and C notes were out of key. Tried everything, embouchure loosening, etc. Uh, but I couldn't sort it out, but I went back to my original mouthpiece and everything seemed to be in tune. What's going on? Right, Lewis, a good question. There's lots of variables in there. I don't know what your original mouthpiece was, but mouthpieces can vary a lot in the shape and the way that they perform for you. So if, for example, you went for a mouthpiece that was a very small tip opening to a mouthpiece that was a very big tip opening, they're going to perform in a completely different way. If you've got two mouthpieces that are very similar, uh, then the sound quality may be different, but the, the way that they perform for you is going to be similar. So it could be that your new mouthpiece was just a lot bigger than your old mouthpiece, which might be causing the problem on, the, on that middle range. So the first thing I would do is experiment with different reed sizes on the new mouthpiece, because you may find that you need to use a softer reed for the new mouthpiece in order to get it to perform properly. But you should, if you're talking about the middle B and C, it shouldn't really affect it. The low B and C is gonna be hard to play if your reed is too hard, a bit like the previous question. So again, it comes down to finding that perfect balance between reeds and mouthpieces. Anything else, guys? Any other comments coming in? A few, do you wanna do, do your quick, your uh, last question first? Or do you wanna just pick Ooh, any reeds? Well? Should I do the last question? Uh, oh, you know what? There was a good question on here. It, well, I thought it was a good one. That's why. The bubbly sounds yeah, one. I yeah, I like this. I like this one. <laughs> right, yeah. So this is a good question. Actually, it's something that we um, we did an article about a while back for the blog, didn't we? Mm. Um, so the question was about how to fix saliva and bubbly sounds in the mouthpiece. If you're pretty new to saxophone, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, and it's really frustrating and it sounds a bit gross. But basically, it, when you playing sometimes your mouthpiece can get very full of its saliva or condensation, moisture in here, and it can bubble and it can be really, really messy. So there's a couple of things happening in here. Um, it could be uh, a climatic thing. If you're in a cold environment and you're blowing hot air through a cold instrument, then you're gonna get condensation. But mostly, it's most commonly, it's your mouth adjusting to having a mouthpiece in it. So our mouth is used to when stuff gets stuck in it, that your mouth is used to making saliva and because it thinks it's eating something. And uh, so it's a really natural thing for it to create saliva when you're playing, unfortunately. It's just a fact of life. But this can equally happen if you're changing to a new mouthpiece, uh, your body can have a reaction to it and it'll start to create lots of saliva. Now, the good news is that it, it will sort itself out in you know a period of days or, or a couple of weeks or something of you practicing and getting used to it. But a couple of things you can do to prevent it or, or to alleviate the problem. Number one, make sure your mouth is always clean when you're practicing. So drink lots of water, brush your teeth if you just had your lunch before you practice your saxophone. And number two, make sure you're always cleaning out that saxophone. At the end of every session, maybe during the session, 
um, and that will help you. So have a, a swab, you know, a piece of fabric with a string and pull that through plenty of times and that will really help. And maybe we can share a link for that article. Yeah, yeah we'll try and find a link and we'll put it in the show notes for this episode. Okay, how is this happening? Every single time, guys, we do these, we run out of time. There's just too much stuff to talk about. There is too much stuff, too much stuff. Well, pick up some of the questions from the feed from this time. We'll pick them up next time. Uh, uh, maybe answer them in the show notes as well. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate you guys sticking around and uh, and hanging out with us for this half hour. And hopefully you've got some useful stuff in there. But we've got two things left to do. First of all, I've got to tell you where you can get the saxophone practice room checklist. So <clears throat> we've got a link for the blog page for this episode. Uh, when you guys can share it in the... In the comments. So if you go to the blog page for this episode on the sax school, uh, mcgillmusic.com um, sax school blog, and you can just literally, no email or anything, you just click the link, download it, print that out, and stick it on your music stand, and I guarantee if you check through those things, sort them out, it'll really help you with your practice. The second thing I need to tell you about is our quiz. So the quiz was who is the sax player who toured for 40 years with the Rolling Stones? Did we get any people that knew this? I'm afraid I don't think we did. I didn't see any answers. I didn't see any answers. No. We didn't get any. These, this is a smart bunch of people, you know. No, no did not. No, we didn't, didn't get any, didn't any responses. No. Okay, I bet when I tell you the name that you'll all know the answer to this. So the sax player that toured with the Rolling Stones for about 40 years was Bobby Keys. So Bobby Keys, the legendary Rolling Stones tenor sax player. Bit of a legend, bit of a crazy guy. I did an interview actually with... Um, Andy Snitzer, who, Andy Snitzer is a, a great uh, sax player who's touring with Billy Joel now, I think, but um, he was touring with the Rolling Stones after Bobby Keys, and he was telling me a story about walking on stage uh, at the start of when he started doing that gig, and picking up Bobby Keys' saxophone, and he couldn't even get a sound out of it, because Bobby Keys had this amazingly big setup with a, like a, a hugely hard reed, I don't know, a four or something, and a really big open mouthpiece. So he had big strong mouth, and that's, I guess, how he could get that huge sound. So, which is kind of interesting, because Andy Smith is an amazing saxophone player. Mm -hmm. So so there you go. Right, well, um, it's been fun today, hasn't it? Yeah, brilliant. Great. Yeah. So thanks everybody for hanging out with us today. Any, um, if you need to get in touch with us, don't forget, you can leave a comment on our Facebook page. You can put a comment on the video on Facebook or on YouTube, uh, or email us, saxcourtmcgillmusic.com, and we always love to hear from you guys. And hopefully, uh, we'll see you next week. And something else you could do if you get a chance is to share this with um, your friends on your Facebook feed so that we can uh, get the message out about more people joining us for next week. So have a great week practicing saxophone, whatever you're doing, and hopefully you can join us next week. We'll see you later.